And welcome to the Jimmy LaRoll Show. And tonight we're going to be going over international law. And my breakthrough into discovering international law actually came through my discovery of a rapper. Uh, there's a rapper known as Puff Daddy, well, formerly known as Puff Daddy. In today's world, he's known as P. Diddy. <clears throat> he owned uh, Bad Boy Records and, you know, several clothing lines, uh, all sorts of cologne. And I, I can't, off the top of my head, I just don't know. That guy had so much uh, economically and in the business world, he had so much. But when I was younger, a friend of mine wanted to submit a demo tape to Puff Daddy. And I did, I did not think my friend was going to get through on the phone to Puff Daddy. We were in a, a, a mall, the Muskegon Mall, in, in the area I live at, the old mall downtown. Now the mall's been torn down and rebuilt somewhere else. But uh, so my friend said, I have the demo tape. I'm going to call Puff Daddy and talk to him. And I said, you're not going to call Puff You're not going to call Puff Daddy. Hey, that's just not going to happen. And he said, I'm going to call him. I'm going to call him. I'm going to call him. So he kept calling and calling and calling, and he finally got through to Puff Daddy. And he was like, and he was like, man, when I talked to him, it was weird. He didn't sound like he didn't sound like he does on. He sounded real. He sounded, you know, he, he sounded real proper. And that made me wonder a little bit about Puff Daddy. Then I started thinking, you know, these guys in the music industry uh, have good education. I discovered that Puff Daddy went to Howard University, and Howard is known as like the Black Harvard. <laughs> Same thing with Morehouse University, and so I was looking into prestigious. I I, I, be, I began learning about the music industry and some of the universities that these uh, producers come from. Then I start looking into the Jack and Jill Club of America, <clears throat> which is a which is a prestigious prestigious uh, Black African American club. And most people think you know these people are basketball players or just entertainers. Most of these people are brain surgeons, lawyers, judges. Uh, the top prestigious people in the United States of America who are African American or black, whatever you want to call it, colored, have come through the Jack and Jill Club of America. <laughs> so there is a book that was written called Our Kind of People by Lawrence Otis Graham, Graham. And he spoke of his experience as a Jack and Jiller. And the book was very fascinating. Um, I read the book years ago. Anyhow, now, after learning a little bit about how Puffy went to went to Howard University, I started looking more into lawyers and stuff that were, were around that time, that era. Uh, not that when Puffy was there, but more back in toward the Jack and Jill Club of America. <sighs> One of my favorite lawyers. Oh, hold on. Let me do a let me do a reading real quick. Now this is Family Encyclopedia of American History. Family Encyclopedia of America, of Family Encyclopedia of American History. And I got this book for a few dollars from some sort of book sale. Okay, Howard University, established 1867, and named for General Oliver Otis Howard of Freedmen's Bureau, co-educational, pre pre predominantly Negro school, with federal support, more than 10,000 students today, many from foreign countries. <clears throat> All right, the reading will start. Sometimes called the Black Harvard, Howard University in Washington, D.C. is the leading university of predominantly Negro enrollment in the U.S. Howard has 15 fully accredited schools and colleges offering 46 degrees, including doctorates in law and medicine. It is considered the nation's most cosmopolitan school, enrolling more foreign students than any other. In the early 1970s, some 16% of its more than 10,000 students were from abroad, representing 80 countries. Whites now make up from 15 to 20% of the enrollment among Howard's graduates are Massachusetts Senator Edward W. Brooks, Supreme Court Justice, Third Good Marshal, U.S. Ambassador, <laughs> sorry, Patricia H. Harris, and five college presidents. Howard University was founded largely through the efforts of General Oliver Otis Howard, head of the Freedmen's Bureau, to help educate the free black population of Washington, D.C., including thousands of ex-slaves who came to the city after the Civil War. Opened with federal support in 1867, the school began holding classes that year. General Howard served as the university's first president 
1869 to 74. At the end of its academic term, Howard had 94 students, largely ex-slaves or the children of slaves. Many had to be taught basic reading and writing skills. Departments of law, medicine, pharmacy were opened in 1868 and 1869, followed by theology, 1870, dentistry, 1881, music, 1883, and engineering and architecture, 1910. From the start, the school which had received an annual congressional appropriation since 1928 has sought to train leaders for the American black community, approximately 80% of its students work to help pay for their studies. So, and this is written, this is this from 1975. That's why I love older books. You're always going to get the best out of them. But, okay, so now you have, can you have Howard University? And uh, some of the other principals, uh, players in the legal field that I researched over the years, F. Lee Bailey, that was around the era of the 60s. I thought he was fascinating. He had a really good spin on the law. Um, there's other lawyers like Charles Gary, who wrote a book called Street Fighter in the Courtroom. Uh, he was a big lawyer in the 60s, worked with the Black Panther Party. He had a very fascinating spin on the law. Uh, but it, one of my most interesting interpretations of studying law actually came from the Salem Witchcraft Trials. And I want to explain law like this. In any area of civilization, there's going to be law. Whether you can go out to, to a remote country, you know, in Asia, somewhere, Africa, a third world country, there's going to be some sort of system of law. So wherever there's civilization, there should be foundational principles that law is based upon. And you have universal law, which is basically natural law, then common law, and then corporate law. And to, to make my point a little bit further for people, I often say this in other videos, when you ask, you know, where United States law exists at, Hey, hey, you can you can have an Indian reservation not far from here. They, they might not be operating on the same law as you. Law changes based on the status of the individual. And this gets into the subject of international law. <clears throat> For instance, if we went down to the Panama Canal in the Panama Canal zone, uh, there are people that live down there who are not under Panamanian law. They're under United States law. They were born within the canal zone. So that makes them a United States citizen or if an individual enters the canal zone who is not a United States citizen, they may be bound to United States law. So dealing with systems of law, um, it depends on the individual that you're going over yourself, not just necessarily the location. But going back to what I say, the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Now, the Salem Witchcraft Trials, I heard a lot of rumors as if the, uh, the real witches were the people holding the trials. That's kind of a joke in the, in, in the research field. There's people, there's people that say, well, you know, the people that were burned at the stake weren't the witches. It was the people holding the trials were the witches. They were pretending to be the Christians, but they were the witches. Then I studied the Salem witchcraft trials a little bit, and then I got into the, the German. More recently, in the last few years, I got into the German witchcraft trials. I mean, the, the trials they held in, middle, in, in Germany, during the, the area of Germany. During the Middle Ages, they had trials, witchcraft trials, and those were predominantly held by the Holy Roman Empire. And so those are sort of, you know, in today's world, I mean, it's not really practical to study witchcraft trials to, to learn current law, but it, helped, it gave me some insight into how the world works. And then just studying, just studying you know, you have, you have United States law, again, you have the United States Constitution, then you have the state constitution. You have... You can have a state judge, then you can have a federal judge. A state judge is elected, that's more political. A federal judge is appointed, so it's very non-political. So depending if you're in a state court or a federal court. Um, and then again, I'm a researcher, and so I would just sit back and just study and research and learn. And then I always found it fascinating that a lot of people aren't familiar with their state constitution, but they always recite the federal constitution. I always thought that was fascinating. Uh, oh, oh, interesting group. The Pinkerton Detective Agency. That's one of the... That might be the oldest. The, old, the oldest detective agency in the country. If not, it's one of the oldest. And it was founded around the time of the Civil War. 
and uh, some of the some of the books they've written and documentation they produced over the years have been extremely fascinating. And so that's one of the references I learned how to, you know, how to study, teach myself how to study. I was looking at material from the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And then it gets into the concept of uh, cemetery law. Cemetery law is very interesting. And there's a lot of people online who teach it. Basically, it's, you know, corporate law. You have the fictitious, you say there's a straw man or a fictitious. Basically, the, in, at the cemetery, a name is written in all capitals on the gravestone. But proper English grammar teaches that your name cannot be in all capitals. So there's a whole array of people in the research field online who go over the subject over and over and over again about, you know, the sovereignty thing and, and the states' rights and, and, and human rights and um, like the Moors. <clears throat> Which, speaking of Morehouse University, uh, Morehouse has the largest collection of, of uh, black Caribbean artifacts in the world. And a lot of people talk about the, go back to the black Negro codes and the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, the, the treaty that the Salt had with, with the United States years, many years ago. And there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, I'm not black, I'm not Negro. I have a nationality and stuff. So I, I studied into some of the some of these uh, I don't even want to call it some of these viewpoints. Because when you there's some people who can get into a courtroom and exercise this stuff and, and, and prove their point and get out successfully. There's other people that can get into a courtroom and they can't exercise it successfully. So now going back to going back. To, to researching. Okay, now, a lot of my research into law, uh, my grandmother was a lawyer, but when I became, when I did my independent research, I would just go back and read old court transcripts. If I was interested in a particular subject, say something happened in the news in the 1950s, I would look for uh, some court transcripts on the case, if it made it to court, if it made it to trial, then I'd try to get the original police report, then I'd compare the police report to the tr court transcripts, and then I would just see if I could get any other information on it, <clears throat> if, it, if it made it into the news, if it didn't make it into the news, and I would just sit there and research and study and just keep going with it. Yeah. And so, let me see. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship, that's what I was talking about. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship is from 19, 1787. And that's supposed to be the oldest treaty Yeah, between the United States and Turkey, and that's supposed to be the oldest surviving treaty that the United States has. Let me look, see who's Oxford. Bring up something I'm more familiar with. Oxford Law. I just like to sit down and listen to these people talk for about 20, 30 minutes. An hour sometimes. The old stuff, like I like looking at cases from way back in the day, like civil rights cases where the Ku Klux Klan or whoever basically get over on somebody. And these people would come back and try to appeal their case. Like the Medgar Evers trial. How oh, they kept going with that thing until they finally convicted the guy.
I says, okay, well, will you pay later? Now, this is one of my favorite lawyers right here. Now, he did the OJ trial, but he was, he was in the newspaper all the time back in his era. And he did the Patty Hearst case. Let me read a little bit about Ashley Bailey. Francis Lee Bailey Jr. is an American criminal defense attorney. For most of his career, he was licensed in Florida and in Massachusetts, where he was disbarred in 2001 and 2003, respectfully. Among other high-profile trials, he served as a lawyer in the retrial of osteopathic physician Sam Shepard, was the supervisory attorney Mark J. Kaddish, and the court martial of Captain Ernest Medina for the Maylay Massacre and was one of the lawyers of defense of O.J. Murray trial. He was a high profile lawyer. He was also had a number of visible defeats, legal controversies, and personal trouble with the law. And was disbar I didn't even know he was disbarred. And Uniform Commercial Code Law That's the Maritime Admiralty Law stuff. That's Man, I remember I used to, I remember I used to sit back and do re and just research and research and research. And I remember one time, what was it? I think it was the birth certificate. And was it the birth certificate? It was a form. Okay, it was it was a form. If it wasn't the birth certificate, it was some sort of form. And at the bottom of the form, it's supposed to say who published the form. And Anytime before this point, it always had a publisher at the bottom of the form. That's how you know you're dealing with a real, a real legal document. Like, first of all, if somebody sends you a legal instrument, they're going to send it through the mail. Um, and it, when you get it, it should say who it's published by. If a document does not say who it's published by, then, you, you know, you're in dangerous territory right there. But I remember I was calling. I called the company. It was... It was some sort of, it was, it was some sort of, I was, however you're doing business with this document I called. And I said, at the bottom of the form, it doesn't say who it's published by. And the woman answering the phone, she got, she was like, oh, like that. She got scared. And then she just hung up the phone. And then I was just like, I was just like, wow, that must be some pretty serious stuff. They're supposed to say who is, it was like a WW2 form or the birth certificate or something. And I called them up and asked them, why doesn't it say who published the form? And they hung up the form. And then I see I'm from, I'm originally from the Midwest, I'm from Michigan, so most law, I believe, is based on East Coast states like Delaware, and all the states coming from the East. And this goes back, you know, this goes back into, like, a lot of people come online and say it's all business and it's all uniform commercial code. To some degree, I have to, to some degree, I have to 
equally agree because you can even see how a lot of the co like Virginia, the state of Virginia is based on the Virginia company, or you you would even have a lot of these states from the East Coast is interesting also as well. You can see how they kind of came from royalty. Like you would have New York, and then before New York you had the Duke of York, then you had the state of Baltimore, then at one point you had Lord Baltimore, and so all of these states and like the words, the word state, S-T-A-T-E, uh, I believe is short for a state, E-S-T-A-T-E, -E. like this is my estate, so you have the state. Then you have, then you can get into magic when it comes to law, going back to the cemetery law thing, how people say, well, I received an instrument in the mail, my name was on it, my name was in all capitals, that, according to proper English grammar, that's not me. And I've heard people explain that in a sense as like a voodoo doll, like you have you, then you have a voodoo doll, and then you stick the pin in the voodoo doll, and so the corporation is like your voodoo doll, like they're summoning you. They're saying this, they're saying, is this you? And you're saying, that's not me, it's all cat. They're saying, well, you know, we don't care, we're summoning you. And so I've heard people online explain the law system uh, as magic. And then, you know, a judge wears a black uniform, a black robe. And, that, and, I, and so I, it, it seems, you know, that gets into some, some, some sort of area of magic. You're being summoned into a room with a guy wearing a black robe and all this stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit strange. And then there's not even, to be honest with you, I don't even think, according to state law, I don't even think there's really supposed to be a bond because according to the state, the state constitution of Michigan, there's no bill of attainer or ex post facto law. And to be honest with you, at least at that time back then, you had debtor's prison. Like you could go, you could, if you owe debt, you know, you could go to jail for that. But, but with the bill of attainer, no ex post facto law. I think at one time you weren't supposed to be able to have a, you weren't supposed to go to, like, have a bond, go to jail and have a bond. But that was back in a time when you had the Upper Peninsula of Michigan could go to war with Michigan and the Michigan could go to war with Ohio. I mean, that was a whole different world. And I think you have to have permission. A lot of people, you know, this is this is an area that I look at. When people go into a court, I think you never see anybody do it, but you're supposed to have permission to cross, like when a lawyer, you say the attorney crosses the bar, um, you're supposed to have permission. That little bar that you cross, you're supposed to ask the judge for permission to cross the bar. When you put your hand on a little gate and cross over, you know, you're entering at your own thing, you know. I believe I believe historically people used to ask for permission to go in there. And then, you know, me myself being mixed. The law is something different to me because I come from, you know, my, you know, like my father's father, father, you didn't even have to, you know, back in, if you were black and lived in Mississippi, that was enough to get you put away for something. Like all somebody had to do was say that you, you killed somebody or you raped somebody or something like that. And you, you'd be like, I wasn't even there. What the fuck are you? I'm excuse me. Like, you'd be like, I wasn't even there. And that's all you had to be. So being, coming from out of the civil rights era of the 1960s, I noticed that at that time, a lot of people would self-educate themselves on civil rights and know, 
you know, if somebody ever asks you, like, if they even tell you when a police officer asks you a question, they even say, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm saying to you is going to be held against you. Anything you say is going to be, is, anything you say can and will be held against you. Will be held against you. So you'd be out of your mind to answer, and if somebody's telling you that it will be held against you, <clears throat> a lot of people in today's world, they don't really have a good interpre interpretation for anything, you know, anything legal or law. And the Bible and the law, a law book in the Bible, used to be the most sold books in the country at one time. Everybody wanted an interpretation of the law and an interpretation of their religion. And the law is cool. One of my other favorite judges is Chief Justice, Chief Justice Berger. I saw him doing a lecture in Japan. I mean, I didn't see him. I wasn't there, but I saw him. Chief Justice Berger. Warren Berger, Second Amendment, fraud, 1991. See, people better watch this stuff. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren. He did the he did the Warren Commission for the Kennedy. Yeah. Let me see Judge School. They had they had some sort of camp or training center for judges. Out west. Of How to become a judge, criminal justice programs. See, this is the type of stuff you condition your mind. If you if you listen to authorities on the law, you, you'll you'll slowly condition your mind, and you'll use it in your everyday life. If you have some comprehension of law, you can use it in everyday life. Just making basic decisions. And then you can teach yourself how to do investigations properly. Like private, let me see, private investor. Private investigator, man. for the purpose of studying case law. Like if you can teach yourself, if you can teach yourself how to be a PI, a private investigator, then you can then you can teach yourself how to study case law. And you can do anything. You can you can learn all sorts of Different stuff. Free too. You don't gotta pay any money. You can just sit here and learn how to be your own private eye detective. See, that's what Johnny Cochran, that's why I, I respect about Johnny Cochran. 
is Johnny Cochran would do something called an offer of proof. Johnny Cochran, Johnny, Johnny Cochran had some little sly tricks he would do. Johnny Cochran would have a whole research team, and he would ask some really good investigators. And at the right moment during the trial or during, or during, the, uh, uh, during, during any sort of hearing, Johnny Cochran, well, you know, I have an offer of proof uh, I, I would like to show. And, you know, you just learn, studying Johnny Cochran, I learned how, you know, some of these lawyers make offers of proof. And these guys are smart, like just listening to, especially economic business law. Business law seems to be one of the most interesting subjects, or one of the, I'm sorry, subject I'm most interested in. And you learn, you know, you learn terminology through legalese, like what something means in a courtroom, what something means in the regular world is two different things. And if you can gain, you know, what's called in a court, what's what's called first-hand knowledge on a subject, it'll take you. So you have first-hand knowledge on this? Yes, I do. And then you can study, you know, you can study, you can get into French law. Well, we, I came up with, we were speaking of international law. But if you go over to a different country like France, you know, they're going to ask, they're going to say, what are you? You can say, well, you know, I'm a citizen, they say it's America. So there's different laws that apply to you. If you were Irish, there'd be certain laws that apply to you. If you were Ethiopian, there'd be certain laws. But if you say you're from the United States, now, now it's a little bit different. There's certain, there's certain laws, or certain things are obligated to. You have to learn what are, what is this, what, are, what are their obligations to me? What are their obligations in the courtroom? If I end up in, in a courtroom in France, what are their obligations? I'm doing a business deal, and the business deal doesn't go so well. What is the court's obligations? And how can you access that? So. If anybody ever wants to do business, the first thing you want to do is get an interpretation of law. And then pull up Magna Carta. This reminds me of that movie with Chevy Chase. Nothing but trouble, where he ends up in that little small town, and the judge is crazy. And he's like, he's like, he's like, you gotta marry, you gotta marry my daughter. And he didn't want to marry the daughter. They got Magna Carta, the Great Charter, the Liberal Rights, commonly called the Magna Carta, Magna Carta Libertarian. Is a charter of rights agreed to by King John of England. That's another thing about like King John with the King James Bible. A lot of the stuff, like I, the King James Bible, a lot of these people, a lot of these people. You know, it was like a political, religious type of establishment. How King James said the King James Bible is the only authorized Bible. So if you had any other Bible, you might get, you'd probably go to jail or get hung or something. And everything is by agreement when you deal.
everything is by agreement. If you notice, a lot of these people had English names. Like if you if you were a, a Indian American Indian, and you change your name to an English name, that just gave the 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 English you know the people running the legal system, the barristers. That just gave them some sort of jurisdiction over you, just because you have an English name. Because they were foreign, they were they represented basically foreign Christians. And they came over as, you know, pilgrims and all that stuff. And then they they got the, a lot of these American Indians on the East Coast started changing their names over into English names. And that gave them, that put them in a situation to, where they're, you know, basically owned by these people. And then pirates, a lot of this, a lot of stuff is pirate law. I, that's the bottom line I have on a lot of this stuff. Like uniform commercial code. I, it might sound rude to some people who, who who are in the legal system, but I believe this is basically pirate law. Like you're dealing, especially with the uniform commercial code, then all these charters and all this stuff. This is pirate law because it was brought from across the seas. Anyway, this is the Jamil Rawls Show.